Hello and welcome to the vlog. Today, a little fireside chat in what is going to be a series of possibly as many as four separate videos on how you buy a narrowboat, what the costs are of a narrowboat and what the cost of living aboard are. Ever since I started vlogging, people have said to me, but what does it cost? And it's a huge topic, so these are probably going to be very long-winded videos. This one is going to be about the process of buying a boat. Then I'm going to do another one about what does it actually cost to buy a boat. And then there'll be a third and possibly fourth one about well, what does it cost to own a boat and what does it cost to live aboard a boat, because those are slightly different things. But for this one, it's basically me chatting away to you about the process of buying a boat. And it's a funny thing with buying a boat, and that's because there really is no proof of ownership unless you are the very first owner buying it from new, from a manufacturer, and you have a nice stamped sales invoice. The weird thing about boats is that there's no registration document like there is on a car. You can't just phone up the boat equivalent of the DVLA and say, are these registered documents true? Because they don't have them. Boats just change hands and whatever paperwork was with the boat goes with the boat, you hope. So when you buy a boat, the first thing to be aware of is that whoever you're buying it from, you're taking it on trust that they really do own the boat and it is theirs to sell to you. So throughout the whole buying process, you need to keep your wits about you. That's not to say everyone is out to do a con, obviously, but there are people out there who occasionally steal boats and will try and flog them on. And there are boats that are in dispute between two different owners and someone will try and flog it on. What you need to do is have a look for as much evidence as you can that the person selling it to you really does have a legitimate claim over it. You want to see invoices, receipts, mooring fees, and okay, if they nicked the boat, they probably found them on the boat. But so far as you can, look for some sort of genuine evidence that the person really owns them. Ask them loads of questions about the boat, because if it's not theirs, they probably don't know the answer to all the little intricate details. Now, you can buy boats privately or through a broker. And you might think, oh, well, broker sounds a bit like a car dealer. It'll be a, a, a more legally sound process. But aha, uh -huh, it's not, because the car dealer almost certainly owns the cars on his lot that he's selling to you. And as such, you have legal comeback if he sells you a lemon. With boats, the broker is purely a sales agent for the person who owns the boat. Well, 99% of the time this is the case. The broker doesn't own the boats. He's just advertising them and doing promotion and marketing them and handling the sale for the owner. So there's much less legal recourse if something bad happens against a broker than there would be if you were buying from a car dealer. So brokers can give you a sense of security and certainly the good brokers don't want to sell you a bad boat because obviously it will affect their reputation. But just buying from a broker does not of itself mean that all your problems and worries have gone away. You still need to have an eye out for anything that could be an issue. If you want to know who the good brokers are, you need to ask around, look on the forums. A lot of people will say, well, let me put it this way. I'm not going to name names, but certain brokerages come up again and again as being trusted and generally liked. And certain brokerages come up again as being, well, you might want to just approach them with a pinch of salt. Obviously, anything you read on an internet forum should also be taken with a big pinch of salt. Use your own brain, have a sniff around, go to all the brokers, at least as many as you possibly can, and you will get a feel for things. And that is also true for when looking at boats. Go and look at as many as you can, ones that are cheaper than you want to pay, ones that are more expensive than you want to pay, ones that are in your price range. It just gives you a very good idea of what you will be able to get for the money and whether certain boats are overpriced or underpriced or whatever. So there you are, you've got a wadge of cash, you want to buy a boat, you go and look at all these different boats and you will have in your mind a set of criteria. You want a 50 foot cruiser, stern, reverse layout, whatever. Pretty much guaranteed you won't get what you thought you were going to get. You'll march onto a boat one day and go, oh, 
This is the one. It's like house buying. You march and you go, this feels right. So now you want to buy that boat. If you're buying privately, you will negotiate the price directly with the owner. If you're buying through a broker, obviously it just sort of becomes this three-way conversation with the broker. Many, many people buy boats without having a survey done. And this can either be a huge saving in money and you never needed to have a survey in the first place, or it can be an absolute disaster. Just yesterday, I was chatting to someone who said he'd come across a boat that had sunk and the guy had bought it a week before without survey. And quite clearly, there was a problem with the um, weed hatch. And I was talking about the weed hatch in my last vlog. And all the water had come in as the guy was taking the boat down the canal and the thing sunk. So he should have had a survey. If you're not going to have a survey, you need to know enough about boats that you can look round one properly and really spot where the faults are. Or bring a friend along and don't trust that your friend who says he knows a thing about boats really does know a thing about boats. Just make sure they really know a thing about boats because there are so many things that can go wrong. That said, what you're really looking for is a good hull and a good engine because everything else is cosmetic. All the interior, you can fix that up. But if you've got a hull that leaks or an engine that won't go, you've got a bit of a problem. So the crucial thing is good hull, good engine, and the rest is, is purely cosmetic. Now, surveys are not cheap. You will need to employ a professional surveyor and professional fees are, well, not cheap. So you're looking at 400, 600 pounds a day. In order for the surveyor to have a proper look at the boat, it's going to need to come out of the water because the surveyor will want to check the hull and check it for soundness. So there will be a lift out fee at a boat yard, which could be a couple of hundred quid. It'll have to go up on the chocks for a bit, for a day or so, while the surveyor looks at it. You're probably going to end up spending a grand on checking out your boat. But also, having spent that grand and having it out, the surveyor will have scraped off some of the blacking on the hull to do his readings of the of the boat. Now, the seller isn't going to be wanting to pay to have the boat re-blacked every, every time someone looks at his boat and decides they don't want it. So almost by the time you get to survey, you're sort of committed to buying it. I mean, you're not. If there, if there was something dreadful wrong with it, obviously you walk away. But what I'm saying is that you probably only want to commission a survey because it's going to cost you and be a lot of palaver on a boat that you are pretty sure you want, provided the survey doesn't throw up anything terrible. So you get the boat out, you pay the surveyor, and be aware again that surveyors will look around for things, but they will indemnify themselves in their contract against not finding things. So if they find something that is wrong with the boat, that's great. Now you've not only got something you can bring the price down with, but they've found a thing you need to fix. But if they miss something, it's pretty much tough luck on you because the contract you signed with them will say, I, I don't promise to find every last fault. So it's worth you being there while the survey is being done, not only to ask the surveyor about what he's doing and what he's finding, but so you can have a jolly good look round the hull and, and the propeller and everything else and just see the condition of the boat as well. It is a bit of a fraught minefield buying a boat. There's all this uncertainty. I remember now, I had forgotten it in the excitement of being on the boat for a year, but I, I cast my mind back and there was a point where I thought, I'm not actually sure this is going to happen because the uncertainty over the ownership and the, the terror of handing over all these survey fees for boats I might want to buy, uh, it, it all seemed like this mountain to climb. But you obviously can do it. Boats are sold all the time. It's just a bit stressful in the way that buying a house is a bit stressful. So you get your survey done, you, you've had the lift out, you've had a look at it, the survey basically says the boat is okay, you think the boat is okay, you can negotiate with the broker uh, or the seller on a price, I mean obviously you'll probably have done a bit of haggling to start with, this is how my boat went. They set a price which was just under £50,000, I haggled a bit off, just to haggle a bit off anyway, but then I had the survey done which threw up that um, the end, what was it, there were some bits needing doing on the engine and there were going to be some electric works needing doing. Anyway, after all that, got a bit more off. 
So you can use the survey as a tool to say, well, this work is going to need to be done. So I don't think your asking price is legitimate. So finally, you agree a price. Be aware that, again, this is what happened in my situation. If you are selling a house to fund the purchase of the boat, certainly the broker I dealt with wouldn't accept a deposit on the boat until I'd exchanged contracts for the sale of the house. Until, in other words, it was cast iron that I was going to be able to provide the balance of the money, they wouldn't even take a deposit, which meant that I couldn't reserve the boat. So, in my case, I had a mad scramble round of selling the car, scraping out all my savings, taking out a horrendous bank loan, which I was planning to take out just for two months till the house sold when I could repay it. I, I borrowed some money as well. I scraped the whole lot together as a sort of interim chunk of money to buy the boat before it exchanged on the house, simply because I knew I wanted this boat. And if they wouldn't take my deposit, I couldn't hold it for me. So I had to just find the funds any which way I could. Bought the boat and thankfully the house then did sell um, a couple of months later and I was able to pay off the loans and all the money I'd borrowed and all that kind of thing. So you can see how it does get pretty fraught. Your circumstances, of course, may well be very different. You've got wadges of cash coming out of your pockets and you just want to throw it at the broker. Well, that's fine. But often it can be a bit of a, a scrape around process. And, and some brokers, I don't know, they may well accept a deposit without you necessarily having the readies or proof of the readies. But quite a few I went to, there were some brokers I went to, wouldn't even let you look at the boats unless you could show them that you were a serious buyer and had the money or had an exchange of contracts on the house. So I, I didn't like that particular approach. There was yeah, a broker who wouldn't fetch a boat out for me, one that I was actually genuinely interested in buying and they wouldn't fetch it off because it was on a further mooring or pontoon or something. So sometimes you have to just kind of be a bit, I don't know, put up with these flipping brokers who don't want to be helpful. So where have we got to? You've, um, you've got the money, you've paid the deposit, you've had the survey, it's all looking good, you're ready to take the boat away, you've found yourself where you're going to keep the boat, we'll come back to that in the next video. You hand over the balance and the broker or owner hands you the keys and whatever documentation, documentation they've got. And it's sort of yours. But that's it. Again, there is no registration to send off to a central registration authority. It's just yours because you own it and you've got a receipt from, make sure you get one from the owner if you're buying privately, or you'll have one from the broker if you're buying through a broker. And then you can sail off into the sunset. So that, um, in a nutshell, is the process of buying a boat. Be aware that it can take weeks. You'll be looking, scouring through all the adverts in the papers. You'll be visiting brokers here, there and everywhere. You've got to be prepared to travel and it can cost you a fortune in, in petrol or train fares, taxi fares, even overnight accommodation. There was a time when I stayed in a Holiday Inn or something because I was going to be visiting a clutch of brokers in the same area and I didn't want to keep making the trip up the motorway. So you have to put a little bit of your budget for simply the process of going to look at boats. But that said, it's quite good fun and looking around other boats was very, very useful. I think that'll do for this one. That's the buying a boat process. The next video I'm going to do is, well, what does it actually cost? What kind of boats can you get for your money? And, well, I'll come to that in the next video. Any questions, as always, drop them down below. I'll do my best to answer. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.